Well, we've just spent the last six weeks talking about how God created the earth. We looked at the week-long creation week and what God did to create the earth. And now we're going to transition to a new topic where we're going to talk about how God destroyed the earth. Uh, God declared on day six that everything was very good and he rested on day seven. And now here we are in chapter six of Genesis and he's destroying the earth. What has happened between the, the creation of the earth and the, now that God's going to destroy the earth? Let's just take a second and remind ourselves what has happened. We've discussed the fall of man in the, in the past, but of course Eve's deception and Adam's willingly willing disobedience before God brought sin into the world and it brought death through that sin and it was a separation, a separation from man and God that occurred because of that disobedience. Uh, the changes that took place in Adam and Eve were instantaneous. They suffered almost immediately the, the problem of death. They saw selfishness arise in their life, blame shifting, they saw fear, they saw nakedness, they saw shame. All these things they saw instantly when they fell from, uh, from gl the glory of God image and, uh, and, were, and became sinners. Thankfully, uh, their choice uh, to choose death instead of life uh, brought horrible changes into this world, but thankfully God left another choice for them after that, po that point where if they would choose to trust him, to believe in the promises he had given them, to follow him, that they would uh, receive forgiveness and mercy from God. They would repent before God and they would receive mercy from God. This was another choice they could make that would not, of course, undo what they had done. God, the, the, the creation's been cursed now, but they, but they would follow in God's footsteps through trust and faith and God would grant them mercy and kindness and righteousness because of that. God's plan to cure their separation was through repentance and faith. Likewise, we've already discussed the uh, topic of Cain. Uh, Adam and Eve had children, and of course we're told about two children. Cain was the firstborn, Abel was the secondborn. We're told that Cain and Abel uh, brought, worship, brought gifts to worship God with, and Cain's offering was not received well, and Cain didn't feel good about that. There was a problem, not so much with how they worship, but how their heart was worshiping. And God brought Cain off to the side and gave him a little pep talk and said, you must master this sin that's, that's crouching at your door and trying to conquer you. Uh, it wants to, it desires you, it desires to master you, but you must desire instead to master it. That is the gift of God to Cain was advice on how to deal with the sin in his life. You must reach a point where you can control it. You must grow to control it. And of course, nobody can control sin in their life without God's help. So God was offering him the help to control sin. All Cain had to do was ask, please God, help me control the sin of my life. And he would have been happy to be there with him to, to do that. Unfortunately, Cain became the first person on earth to actually ignore God's advice regarding sin and let sin master him instead. And what happens when sin masters you? You get into a huge problem. You become a minion of Satan. And you can see that as a minion of Satan, he began to obey Satan and he worked, out, uh, he, he worked out Satan's will in his life, not God's will in his life, but Satan's will. He became a murderer and a horrible liar and God had to bring him an additional curse upon his life. Uh, there was already a curse of death because of Adam and Eve's sin against God and all the children of Adam and Eve inherited that same sin, but we have an additional curse on Cain. If you choose to become a minion of Satan, and let, and let sin master your life, you must be separated from the rest of the world. So separation again. Sin separated us from God. Uh, accepting the mastery of sin and control of your life is another way that you, must be, you will then be separated from other men. That's, uh, that's a problem. Uh, an important note in this story is that even though Cain became a murderer, God didn't kill Cain. There wasn't an additional death involved when Cain became a murderer. All there was was an additional separation. I think that's important. God was merciful to Cain and God left Cain on this world as a, as a gift to him. Uh, now Cain had, had problems. He was supposed to be a wanderer. He was not gonna be helped by anybody else and, and he couldn't, the, the ground would not grow crops for him anymore. And so that should have been 
enough of an inspiration to Cain to help him learn to repent, to learn to repent of what he had, he had done and to come to God again for mercy and forgiveness. But as we see, Cain's clan grew in the cities that he built and it became a real problem. They were separated. Adam was separated and his clan was separated from Cain and his clan. They were separated. So we see now this principle of separation. God creates a separation in order to help us survive uh, this curse of sin that's in our hearts and the curse of sin that's in the world. It's really difficult to handle the sin in, in our lives. It's even harder to handle it when there's sin in other people trying to work into our lives and influence as well. So we've got the sin of the world, the sin of our own, suf our own selves, and the curse in ourselves. And we've got the sin of others trying to influence us to be worse. You know, God instituted governments to give them the power to help uh, to help with this problem. And God, governments have the power to separate people who can't control themselves from people who are trying to live lives of peace. That is the purpose of government. If you cannot control yourself, government will control you for you, either by uh, punishing you to help you learn your lessons, or they will send you to a jail to be a penitentiary, where it's called a penitentiary because you can be repentant and learn your, the ways of your wrongness in a penitentiary, or they can actually provide you with, uh, or they can actually provide a remedy through a death penalty if, you, if, you're, a, if you're a flagrant violent murderer. So governments are, are resolved on this, or governments are created on this earth and given God's authority to do the separating that God had commanded earlier in the days of, uh, of, of Cain. So you remember God banished Cain to wander outside and, and this would hopefully lead Cain to repentance. But uh, unfortunately, Cain's clan began, continued to follow not after God and Adam's clan did their best to follow toward God. So this is a very quick overview of what happened between Genesis chapter one and two and Genesis chapter six when we see God's about to destroy the world. Our goal for next time will be to discuss kind of the nuts and bolts and the, the details of that flood and where it left the world after it was the world was destroyed by the flood and what evidences we can see of that and what warnings it tells us. Today we're going to talk about understanding this most important vital uh, judgment that God created on the earth. Uh, the very first creation is a very important thing to study. We also need to study the very first judgment on the earth because it's an example for us living today. I'm not going to go through uh, initial passage. We're going to run through our passages as we, as we preach today. Uh, so let's just begin now with prayer and ask God's help. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, and we're going to be opening your word in many ways today. But every time we open it, we want your help. We need your spirit to guide us. We need truth to be illuminated in our hearts. We need an explanation. We need an understanding. So I just pray, Father, help us as we understand your word. Teach us from it, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So we've got that situation where Adam's clan is separated from Cain's clan, but the separation breaks down. Beginning in, in chapter 6, we see the separation is starting to break down. You know, you can imagine, and it's happened more than once in the history of, the, of, uh, of God's people, is that when uh, a evil part of the world begins to mix with a kind of a holy and righteous part of the world, there's kind of a mixing that never influences the good side. It always influences the bad side. God separated his people, the Israelites, from the other peoples so that they would not fall into the other people's problems. But more over and over, marriage, intermarriage, caused problems with uh, God's people. And here we have the same thing. Intermarriage is causing problems with God's people. If a righteous man marries an unrighteous woman, the chances are only slim that that's going to work out okay. And if an unrighteous man marries a righteous woman, there's only a slim chance that that's going to work out okay. In every situation, there is a, a degradation in their relationship, and the children that come from that marriage are going to be dysfunctional, are going to have problems. So there's, there's a problem when, when two factions of, of, uh, of people of truth and people of, of lies kind of uh, try to mix together at, uh, at a marriage type of situation. That's a big problem. So even today, we're told to not be unequally yoked. That's the problem. So Jesus, I want to turn us now to the New Testament for just a second because Jesus outlines a pattern of judgment 
And when he wanted to outline this pattern of judgment, he actually used this story of Noah's flood as that pattern. Let's read together Luke chapter 17. This is verses 26 through 28. And just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark, and the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same as happened in the days of Lot. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just the same on that day that the Son of Man is revealed. Jesus both used, uh, used two different judgments here to bring us a pattern of judgment. Man is clueless, preachers urge repentance, and judgment destroys everyone. We're going to see these three principles in the pattern of judgment. And God used Noah and God used Lot to show the world this pattern of judgment. We're not going to take uh, time to look at the pattern of judgment that's explained through uh, Lot's experience, but we are going to take a lot of time and go back to Genesis 6 and take a careful look at the judgment of Noah's time to see how it fits this pattern. So here is Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. See if you can see what I'm talking about. Now it came about when men began to multiply on the face of the land, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, whomever they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he is also flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were in the earth in those days, and also afterwards, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, that every intent of the thoughts and the heart was only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot man out whom I have created from the face of the land, from man to animals to creeping things to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord." I don't want to drift around too much as we discuss this passage, but I do want to again point out that this passage is somewhat tricky to interpret. You know, I'm not confident enough in every uh, form of interpretation here to be dogmatic about any one interpretation, but I want you to know that there are a lot of people out here that see this passage as a claim that there was some demonic intermarriage going on with human beings. And I don't see that personally, but they have a strong case when they point out that the sons of God, wherever else it's used in the Bible, is always referring to some sort of an angelic form of being and or demonic form of being, but not a, uh, a, a offspring of Adam and Eve. So that, they've got a good point in there. But the point that comes back to my heart all the time is that God continually uses the term man several times to describe whom he is disappointed with. For example, the Spirit of God will not strive with man forever. The wickedness of man was great. I will blot out man whom I have created. These terms always refer to the men God created that we just read about back in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2. That's the kind of man that God is about to block out. He's not going to be blotting out angels. He's not going to be blotting out demons. So I have a little bit of trouble being dogmatic about this, but you can find interpretations in both ways. The historical interpretation has been that the sons of God referred to Adam's clan and the sons of, of man referred to Cain's clan, but you can actually see it the other way as well. So it's hard to be dogmatic about this. So back to our point. The flood of Noah illustrates a perfect pattern of judgment. Pre-flood peoples were in a horrible mess. They were living horrible lives. They had wandered so far from God's glory and the intention of what God had created in them that God had no choice but to start over with some new ground rules. So let's look again as, as we continue on to see what really is getting God's goat about these people. Verse 9, these are the records of the generation of Noah. Noah was a righteous man, blameless in his time. Noah walked with God. Noah became the father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. God looked on the earth, and behold, it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way upon the earth. 
Then God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. And behold, I'm about to destroy them with the earth. You know, Jesus' depiction of using the flood of Noah as an example of ju judgment is absolutely genius because it shows a stark contrast of what God sees when he looks at the earth and what man sees when he looks at societies of the planet. When, God, when man looks at the planet, they see normal. When God looks at the planet, he sees abnormal. That's just how people are right now. People are just doing their own thing. They are doing what's right in their own eyes. People are not choosing to resist sin. They're not choosing the narrow way. They're not trusting God. And they are not turning away from evil. They are hearts, their thoughts of their hearts are only evil continually. Notice that God repeats two words several times here. The first one is the word corruption, which is used three times. And the second one is used as violence is used twice. Even today, people talk about violence and corruption as a call to action. Violence and corruption is something we need to, to get rid of. We need to turn it away. Well, that's exactly how God feels. No wonder it's built into our own souls. Violence and corruption are what, God, what causes God to take action and to perform judgment. We need to make sure that our own souls are not filled with violence and corruption. That's the test for you today. Look at yourself. Do you see violence and corruption in your own soul? If you do, it's a gift from God that you do. This self-awareness of who you are and what you are on the inside, that you really are not good at your very core. You do steal. You do lie. You do have self-interest. You do have lustful desires. These are things that if we recognize them within ourselves, this type of self-awareness is our salvation. And we can go to God and we can say, Lord, please help me. I am in the judgment seat. I am in the, the seat of the court and I'm going to be condemned. I need your help. I need your mercy. If you don't see your own violence and corruption, then this blindness, this darkness, is what's going to lead to your uh, demise. God is going to... Uh, be your judge, and you are going to be in the uh, in, in going to be destroyed. People that people that don't have this kind of self awareness, they continually they see it in others, but they don't see it in themselves. They they accuse others of what their own lives are filled with, and of course they blame others for all the violence and corruption in the world. But it really comes from me. If you can say it comes from me, that is a gift from God. People are in a contest today to see who can hate the most. People are in a contest, and the most virtuous people are the people who hate the right people. That's the way the world goes. Pornography is so horrible today. Over half the bandwidth on the Internet is used by spreading pornography around the planet. This is a horrible thing. God sees all the insides going on in our hearts and lives in the private dark places of our lives, and he's not happy with it. But if we can see it ourselves, we have got one step ahead. We can follow the plan God has, has laid out so that we can choose a better future for ourselves. We can follow God. We can trust him for the future, and we can find mercy and grace because he's offering it freely. Before we get into our three points about judgment that Jesus brings up, let me just point out that God is very, very patient. Look at, ver at Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. Then the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, because he also is flesh. Nevertheless, his days shall be 120 years. Now this 120 years does not mean that men's lifetimes are going to be shortened down to 120 years. This means, no, I have started a timer ticking, and it started 120 years, and when it gets down to zero, that will be enough time for men to have figured out that they are in trouble, to repent, and to turn from their wicked ways and ask me for, for mercy and forgiveness. And if they don't do that, I am going to lose my patience and destroy the earth. That's what the 120 years is talking about. God is very, very patient. Remember, here's uh, 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. The Lord is not slow about his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Or how about Romans chapter 2, verse 4? Or do you think lightly of the riches of his kindness and tolerance and patience, not knowing that the kindness of God leads you to repentance? That is the problem. God is very, very patient, but man will not repent, given no matter how much time is given him. We're, we're running out of time. 
This is the time where if we want to repent, we need to repent now. Let's go to our first point. Man is absolutely clueless. Jesus said they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were given in marriage. Mankind is doing what mankind has always been doing. They've been just going about their own business, doing what they, what's, what's their, on their own mind, seeking their own self-interests, enjoying life, enjoying pleasures, seeking after comforts and ease. Their minds are focused on earthly, temporal matters when God is an eternal being. If we don't focus our minds on what's eternal, we're going to be lost in the material world and we're going to be, we're going to be doomed for it. We must keep our eyes on God. We must keep looking up. Nobody was on duty watching for God's judgments. Nobody was there to alert, to sound the alarm or raise the alert because everybody had their head down just looking at this world and seeking their own pleasures. This is absolute cluelessness. There's an entire spiritual world of eternity going on around us, but if your mind is locked into the temporal world, then you are clueless. Paul knew the same pattern well when he talked to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. He said, while they are saying peace and safety, then destruction will come upon them suddenly like labor pains upon a woman with child, and they will not escape. People are after peace and safety. They want just comforts and ease. They want people to leave them alone and they, so they can spend their time and focus on what makes them happy. That's it, happiness. The Sermon on the Mount, Jesus ended his sermon like this. He said, he said, the gate is small, the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. So that's the man is clueless. Let's talk about how preachers urge repentance. This is uh, verse 27 of Luke chapter 17. These are Jesus' words again. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. Preaching will always look like uh, foolishness to a perishing world. That's uh, f preaching is, is not something that makes sense to people who are focused on temporal matters. When you start talking about repentance, talking about turning from your wicked ways and following God, that just sounds like foolishness. Preaching is always going to sound like foolishness, but preachers urge people to repent. I've mentioned before, repentance will got, not get a murderer anywhere. If you're a murderer and you come before a court and a judge and you say, Judge, I promise I'll never do it again, that's not going to get you anywhere. You must also have mercy from the judge. That's the only way you can be uh, released from the guilt of your murder. That's the only way it'll happen. You, you must have repentance because that's actually what gets you in the door when mercy is available. And then because mercy is something that happens in the future. It happens after we pass away. It's, it's part of our next life. Mercy and grace and kindness and forgiveness are things that happen in the next life. Because of that, we must have faith and we must trust God. So repentance, trust and faith in God, that brings us hope, the hope and the joy. Heal us. They heal our souls. We feel much better when we have joy in our hearts. That's what comes when we've been forgiven. And because forgiveness runs directly opposite of the justice of God's character, we need something even more. We need a Savior. Jesus Christ is our hero. He came and died on the cross, and he provided a path so that God could release his mercy, grace, love, and forgiveness and satisfy his justice. And his justice was taken out with wrath spent against Jesus Christ on the cross so that we would not have to die eternally. We would not have to perish and be, and be given over to hell. It's, Jesus is our hero. So we must repent. We must trust and put our faith in God. We must know the promises of God bring us hope and joy. That joy will bring us healing in our souls. And Jesus Christ makes all the difference in the world because he is our hero. He's the one that made God able to be a righteous judge and still have mercy and forgiveness for sinners. Jesus is our hero. You know, Noah built an enormous ark, and he did, built this ark right in the middle of his front yard, probably right there on dry land, probably right there where the city and the people of the cities around him could see him building this ark. And this ark was nothing small. This ark was huge. This ark was ginormous. So it would be no mistaking that Noah was up to something out there in the middle of his front yard. 
But the people, they were marrying, they were drinking, they were eating, they were giving in marriage, and to them this ark was utter foolishness. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5, refers to Noah as a preacher of righteousness. Let's start at verse 4 and here read about this. For God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to pits of darkness reserved for judgment. And did not spare the ancient world, but preserved Noah, a preacher of righteousness, with seven others when he brought the flood upon the world of the ungodly. And if he condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to destruction by reducing them to ashes, having made them as an example to those who would live ungodly lives thereafter, and if he rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day by their lawless deeds. Then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh in its corrupt desires and despise authority. Of course, not all of us are preachers. That's, that's okay. God has created some as preachers, some as prophets, some as evangelists, given us various gifts. Not all of us are preachers. But as Christians, we should be willing to live in a way that builds the ark of Jesus right in our front yards. The people that see us, the people that know us, the people that live by us should be able to uh, experience the ark of Jesus being built right in our very front yard. That's the way that we become a preacher. We're not all going to have the ability to stand behind a pulpit and, t and talk about a message, but you are the salt of the earth. You are the city set on a hill. Your light will shine before men. This is your first step to being a preacher. Just obey God and see the, f the, see the righteousness of God work in your life, and this will be attractive to those that are willing to repent. This is what God did through Noah. Noah was merely obedient and righteous in his obedience, and this was the preaching that was presented before a perishing world. It's going to be our preaching, too. We are responsible to do that kind of preaching as well. Obey God. Let your light shine before men. God receives the glory. Men are called to repentance. So practice a 30-second gospel presentation. Meditate on God's plan of salvation so you understand what it means. You don't have to argue about the plan of salvation. We're coming to a time now where people are going to be uh, jumping ship from this world, wanting to get onto the ark, and all we're going to have to do is give them a logical explanation of how to get there. That's all you need. There's going to be uh, a spirit of, a, of conviction in their lives, which is going to bring their minds a comprehension of truth. It's going to bring their, mind, in their minds a hunger for God, and all you have to do is just tell them the gospel message. That's all you have to do. Just give them the beautiful, raw truth. Be ready for the coming judgment and be ready for the coming harvest. So we've seen that man is clueless and that preachers, uh, preachers warn about repentance. And lastly, we're going to see that judgment destroys everyone. In Jesus' warning about the flood, remember what he said? He said that nobody escapes. This is verse 27 again. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Today we live in a world where everyone has gotten away with something. We've gotten away with breaking God's laws, with breaking society's laws, and we've not gotten caught, we've not been struck by lightning, we've not been arrested and had been handcuffed and thrown in a car. Lots of us have gotten away with so much, and it emboldens our hearts to continue to be lawless. For you and I as Christians, it causes us remorse, regret, pain, and guilt, and we then go to God or go to whoever we've wronged and we ask for forgiveness. But this world, when they get away with something, they feel like they've won the lottery. That's how when you, when you, uh, when you have a lawless heart, and lawlessness is sin, when you have a lawless heart and you get away with breaking the law, it just emboldens people to break the law more often. And finally, we've reached the point today where everybody is looking for a ways that they can break the law and get away with it. It's the kind of lawlessness which has gotten out of, out of hand. God's patient, patience eventually runs out. And when it runs out, everybody is going to get caught. Every single person that's been lawlessness, that's been breaking God's laws with impunity, is now going to find the, the judgment that they were missing in God's judgment. 
There's been warning after warning. There's been alerts and they've been, been unheeded. There's been all sorts of reminders, notices, and prompts, and they've all been ignored. And then God comes to mete out judgment. You know, the casual eater, the casual drinker, the casual marrier and giving in marriage doesn't think their lives are worth judgment. They're going to sit there and they're going to say, God, I don't deserve this. I, it's not my fault. I wasn't being wrong. I wasn't killing anybody. I wasn't murdering anybody. But God is going to stop every single mouth. Listen to Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Uh, Paul points this out. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and that the world may become accountable to God. All God is going to have to do is say, did you or did you not break the law? And you're going to say, oops, yes, I broke the law. My mouth is in. He's going to close your mouth just like that. There's going to be no more bickering in front of God when he reminds us that we have broken the law. We are lawbreakers in our very soul. That's why we need to come to God for mercy right now. We need to hurry to him and ask him for forgiveness while the door is open and ask him to, to forgive us of the sins that we've got. When God delivers that final judgment, no one is going to have any more complaints. There's going to be no argument when God brings that justice. All that will remain is regrets. We began our message today talking about separation, uh, the different separations. The, or the first sin of Adam and Eve separated them from God and his holiness. The separation that, created, that God created when Cain became the uh, first minion of Satan created a separation. And finally, there's going to be another separation where God is going to separate eternally those who have not been found on his side of the cross at the end of the days. This is Matthew chapter 13, verses 41 through 43. The Son of Man will send forth his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all stumbling blocks and those who commit lawlessness, and will throw them into the furnace of fire. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father. Who ha who, he who has ears, let him hear. If you have ears, let it be known right now that that weeping and gnashing will be eternal. And you will sit there every, say, every single day going, I wish I had given the, taken the chance when it was given to me. You're going to be gnashing your teeth in torturous pain of the guilt that your soul has been ridden with and the regrets that will su you will suffer all your life. Now is the time that we need to turn to God. Remember the reason Jesus brought up this whole topic of Noah in the first place? The topic of Noah and the flood was to tell his listeners that just as it was in the day of Noah, just as it was, there was a worldwide, unexpected, patiently forewarned, complete judgment coming upon the earth and there's another one coming to the earth near you. And it's going to be this time led by Jesus and his angels. Here is Luke chapter 17, verse 26 again. Listen to this. And just as it happened in the day of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. Jesus is coming again. Mark it. God does not plan epic judgments like we plan birthday parties. This is something that's coming, and it's going to be professional. It's going to be done right and it's going to affect every single person who deserves God's judgment. We need to get out of the way quickly. When Jesus returns, it's going to be swift and merciless. God's next judgment will be to reshape the earth just like he did in Noah's day. Jesus will destroy his enemies. Our last chance to play a part in this is coming up now. We can harvest souls right now by being ready. We need to escape the judgment by being right with God and we need to warn others by our own righteousness, by the message from our mouth, from the message of our own lives in obedience to God, that God is coming. If you can't shoot a gun, for heaven's sakes, please grab some ammo and help carry some ammo to the front lines because this is going to happen very quickly and it's going to happen very suddenly. You know, our world is filled with rapid communication and lots of technology. And it seems like God is farther away than he's ever been before. But that is just the point. That is just the point. The farther it looks like God is, is away from us, the more sudden and immediate is going to be his return. His return is right around the corner, and we must be ready. Heavenly Father, thank you for this message. That first judgment is exactly the message of warning that we need. This world is going to perish just as quickly and rapidly and qu as fast as it did back in the days of Noah. The judgment will come swiftly, 
and you will have no mercy upon those who have not followed you. So I pray, Father, bring truth, bring the conviction of your spirit, bring uh, your message of hope through repentance, through believing in your promises, through trusting and following Jesus to so many hearts right now because this is the ark of Jesus waiting to leave the shores and rescue this world from the coming wrath. Father, I thank you for this message today. Thank you for your spirit's guidance. And I just pray, have mercy on the souls that are listening. This I pray in Christ's name. Amen.